we're all on social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. But from a business standpoint and a professional perspective, how should we view these social media outlets and all of this time? Is it a good thing? Is it a waste of time? And how should we be doing it? Today on episode 126 of CXO Talk, we are speaking with a master. I'm Michael Krigsman, and my co-host is Vala Afshar. Hey, Vala, how are you? Michael, I'm doing great, and I am super excited to learn from, as you said, truly a master in social media and business. The, so please, with the introductions, Michael. The chief digital officer of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Sri Srinivasan. Sri, how are you? I'm great, and I'm still absolutely delighted to be back with both of you on your on your show. It's just an amazing platform. I have done a lot of different things, including lots of television. But a, you get my pronunciation of my last name right, and b, you also uh, get a lot of eyeballs to whatever it is you do, which is pretty amazing. Well, That's with awesome. guests, Thank you, Sri. with guests like you, so Sri, uh, let's start. Please share share your background. You have a really interesting background, so please uh, tell us about your background. Sure, um, I'm a, a professor. I was a professor for 21 years at Columbia University, teaching digital media, and then um, came to the Met to work here as the chief digital officer. I had been the chief digital officer at Columbia University, thinking about the future of education, and here. And think about the future of culture. And they're both wonderful institutions that have at their core the idea of connecting with their customers, if you will, or their stakeholders through a physical place and great expertise. Those are very much in common that they both have, something they have in common. And here we take that and see how we can kind of make it more uh, connected between the digital world and that physical world and see how we can expand what we're doing and extend what we're doing in the museum. I like to think I run a 70-person startup inside a 145-year-old company. <laughs> Sri, talk to us a little bit about your work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Well, our work here is to tell a million-plus stories about our million-plus pieces of art to a billion-plus people. And on your show, I said the future of business is storytelling, and you guys took that quote and blew that up, and you know this will be on my tombstone now because of you guys. And uh, what I've what I've learned from that, first of all, is just to see how you're able to bring eyeballs to things you're doing, but also to pick out nuggets that people care about. And that's what we're trying to do here at the Met to keep the expertise, the scholarship, the knowledge that we have, but make it more accessible. So we don't want to dumb down what we have here. We want to capitalize on the expertise. One of the things I've learned here is that in a world where everybody's a storyteller, the trained storytellers stand taller. In a world where everybody's a journalist, the trained journalist stands taller, trained photographer stands taller. I mean, I'm just looking at the videos here. My video doesn't look very good, but Mike's video looks fantastic because he invested in some good lights and just ma made the system look better, made that advantage. And by the way, that's also one of my favorite sayings, make your own luck. And that's sort of what Mike uh, has done here. So at, at, at the Met, what we want to do is to see how can we take what we're doing here in these physical buildings. We have two physical buildings, the Metropolitan Museum on 81st uh, Street and 5th Avenue, the world's largest encyclopedic museum, New York's largest tourist attraction. We just announced record attendance of 6.3 million people. We have another location called the Cloisters, which is up Upper Manhattan, uh, it's a medieval garden, and someone said on uh, Instagram the other day, I love going to the cloisters, it reminds me of Game of Thrones. And we are now building a, we're going to have a third institution, physical institution. Uh, you might know the beautiful Whitney Museum in, uh, on the Upper East Side has moved down to a place called the High Line, which is a big new part of New York. Um, and there it's, and it's building, it has built a 21st century, native 21st century museum. The Met is a native 19th century museum, uh, but they've built a 21st century museum, as is the 9-11 Museum. We're taking over their old space 
on 74th Street. So we have three physical locations, but we also have what my boss, Tom Campbell, calls the third, the fourth location, which is the digital Met. And that's what we want to do, is to see can we connect the physical Met and the digital Met and connect it with the world in smarter, better ways. Well, of course, the Metropolitan Museum is a venerable American institution. And today, we are going to do what we call a lightning edition. And we're going to ask you a series of rapid fire questions. And you're going to give us rapid fire answers back. And during the course of the next half an hour or so, we're going to learn how to do social media better. How's that? That sounds great, though I got to tell you, you guys really know what you're doing on social. So, uh, so I, I will. I, I'm, I'm not. I don't know how much you'll learn from me, but I'm happy to share what I know. Well, we're going to learn a lot from you, Val. You want to kick it off? Sure. Let's do this. And now, for the kind folks that are following us on Twitter, we are going to do this rapid fire. Hopefully, there's time at the end of the show for you to ask your questions, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll follow our normal uh, CXO talk. Uh, after the la rapid fire sessions, we'll start with the question three. What is the role of social media in business? Social media is so important for business, but it's something that I think people are only understanding in in, in kind of slow dribs and drabs. You would think people would get it. It's now you know more than ten years of the world understanding the importance of social media, but it also took a long time for people to understand even the value of the web of email. And now we're seeing that social media can help you connect with audiences better, with stakeholders, with customers. It can help you listen for trends, ideas, and where things are going. It can also help you build out your brand. And it can also bring attention, traffic, sales to the work you do. So depending on the industry you're in, social media is absolutely critical for everything you do in business. It doesn't replace your traditional ways of doing business. What you what it does is it adds another layer of, let's face it, complexity, but also of opportunity. How can we use social social media to build relationships? What social media allows you to do is to build relationships through the idea of listening, connecting, engaging. And what that means is that traditional media companies, uh, traditional companies have been all about just kind of sending out broadcasting what they're doing. Now you can connect with people, you can be part of their lives without actually trying to make a sale. We find increasingly there's so much skepticism among customers and the public about kind of the, the things that about corporate advertising, about, uh, about messages where you're trying to sell things, that it's much better to uh, to be part of their lives by being useful, relevant, interesting in their lives. And then they, they would see your content and what you're posting and say, oh, maybe I do want to buy that or go to that or whatever it is. So that's how I think social media can help you by connecting with people when you don't need them so that they can be there for when you need them. Sweet. Sweet. Uh can we use or can we use social media to help us sell more? The answer is absolutely. You can use social media to sell if you don't start out by saying you're going to sell. Instead, what you should be doing is to say, how do I raise awareness? How do I show people that this is something really cool, really useful? Uh, it's a game changer. That's something that people want in their lives. And then you can see that people want to buy it. You've got to build that demand. And that's what we have seen in so many companies that understand this, that you want people to uh, be interested in what you're doing rather than saying they, you want them to be interested in buying what you're, what, you're, what you're selling. And this applies to products, to services, to ideas. If you're in the business of selling anything, you want to be in social, but you want to be very careful about how you do it. And the way you can think about it is, let me make content that's engaging, interesting, and then when the time is right, I can sell because people will want it on their own. Another way to think about this from an earlier digital age is that Google, when it first came out, was the opposite of all the other search engines. You might remember that the search engines were like portals filled with all these other things you could do. 
Instead, Google came along, plain white page, and they just took you directly where you wanted. They didn't buy advertising. They didn't buy a Super Bowl ad back in the days. They just did their work and did it really well. And people loved it. And then when it came time to make ads and sell ads and all of that, they did such a brilliant job. And of course, they're a huge company today. That's what we should be doing in the world of uh, social as well. Let's just make great products and great content and we'll be successful. Sometimes I'm asked by businesses, oh, I have a product. Uh, can, can we think about how to get more attention on social? Well, you've got to get a good product first. That's the key. OK. Now, to put more pressure on you, I'm going to ask you, let's do short answers. Really oh short. My God. Those are, this is what it tells you. I'm, I'm so old-fashioned that I thought those were short answers. So you're those, telling those were No, those short. answers are perfect. Um, <laughs> OK. But let's go. But now, now we're going to. Now we're going to ramp it up. So okay. how should we create a social media strategy? How can one create a social media strategy? You do it by understanding your, your business really well, your customers really well, and your potential customers really well. And then you sit down and you think, what makes sense for them in terms of the platforms you're interested in that they will also be interested in? And you don't need to be first on every platform, but you have to be uh, where your customers are and your potential customers are. You know the old saying, fish where the fish are. So you start by understanding that, and then you sit down and look at what kind of content will make sense for you. You don't have to be on every platform, but you have to see also which content makes sense for which of the kinds of audiences you have and potential audiences you have. I hope that's fast. Perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. Sri, you have an incredible personal brand. Uh, you know, you have obviously your chief digital officer. So your 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 circle of friends are not only CDOs but CIOs, CMOs, and many many executives and business thought leaders. How did you develop? How does someone use social media to build a strong personal brand, and why does it matter? Social media can help you build this brand if you set out to be authentic, be yourself and really know what you're doing. One way I think about it is if you're good in real life, you can be great on social media. This is something that uh, Erica Anderson, who works at Twitter, says. She says, if you're good in real life, you can be great on Twitter. I like to say, if you're great in real life, you can be awesome on social media. So thinking about how you can take who you are. Social media does not make your brand. Social media amplifies who you are, amplifies your brand. So if you're terrible in real life, you're late all the time, you deliver bad products, bad, bad service, you badmouth people, you're boring, you're irritating to people, then social media will take that and amplify it, and you'll be awful on social media. On the other hand, you're a great business executive, you do good work, people care about what you have to say, you can be awesome, and that's what you need to do. What are the steps to building a personal brand? First step is understanding which of the social media networks make sense for you. I think depending on most, for most people, you know, they're on Facebook and then they can maybe do one more thing. Uh, so, uh, so you would join the platforms you want to be on and then uh, start posting content that's useful, interesting, helpful, and don't like, you know, don't post about shoes all day unless you're in the shoe business. Uh, post content that will help other people. I talked to uh, some uh, political folks who are very good on social media, and they say they make content not for their audience. They make content that their audience wants to share with other people. So that's what you want. You want such great content that people want to take it and sell, not sell it, share, share it with other people. And that's what you want to do. Can you recommend, is there a balance in terms of personal related content versus company related content when you're using social media? And let me be more specific, let's say Twitter, because it may vary from platform to platform versus, you know, Instagram, Facebook versus Twitter. But on Twitter. Well, all three, is that okay? We'll talk about. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. And, and Mike, I'll promise to be fast. So <laughs> on, Twitter, on, on Twitter, what you want to do is. Um, uh, well, first let me just say that it's very hard to separate out the personal and the professional. That was possible uh, years ago 
people would say Twitter is for work, LinkedIn is for work, Facebook is personal. That's no longer the case. What happens when your best customer asks to be your friend on Facebook? What happens when your uh, uh, one of your board of directors uh, asks you to be uh, your friend? Like, there's it's hard to separate that. So the safest thing to do is to presume that everything you see is visible to everybody and find out who is influential in your in your circle and think about them when you're posting. So on Twitter, what I like to do is to think about I'm going to be on point with my work, the kinds of topics I'm interested in. Tell people that in your bio. Be really clear about what you're going to be posting about and then post about it. Occasionally if you bring in your family, you bring in your vacation, it doesn't matter as long as you're on point uh, most of the time. Uh, that's on that's on Twitter. On face uh, on on Facebook, it becomes much harder because we have so much personal stuff we post on there. Become a master of the Facebook uh, ways in which you can control who sees your content. You can make lists of your content. You can direct it to the public, to just your friends, to specific business interests. You can do that on Facebook, but it's a lot of work. Some people just make it all public and make sure they don't post anything really personal on there. Uh, on Instagram, it's a little different. And by the way, my boss, the director of the Met, Thomas Campbell, is on Instagram and not on Twitter. And the reason he's on Instagram, people say to me, hey, Sri, you're Mr. Twitter, why isn't he on Twitter? He's on Instagram because there's less drama on Instagram. You can uh, be there, you can be kind of yourself, and I'd love for you to see what he's doing, at Thomas P. Campbell, and you'll see that he's doing a mix of uh, things about his own work, about the museum, but he's also talking about other museums, and occasionally he has his family in there as well. And that combination has worked well for him. There is no formula on social media. People always ask for a specific formula that will guarantee success. What there are are guidelines, and you have to become a student of your own social media. Try something, see if it works. Why didn't it work? Try something else. But uh, it's very important for you to be patient and work on it very, very systematically and strategically. Terrific. How can we connect with influencers on social media? I tell people it's not who follows you on social, it's who follows who follows you on social, meaning influencers. So make a list of the influencers who you want to connect with and then connect with them. And how do you do that? You retweet them. Well, first you follow them, you retweet them, you answer their questions, you comment on their work. And over a period of time, people notice and they start following you. They'll also unfollow you because you might be boring. But you have to reach out one person at a time and, and decide who you're following. I recommend a tool called Twiangulate. Twiangulate, like triangulate but with a W, that shows you who your most influential 100 followers are, your top 100 followers based on how many followers they have. So find them, connect with them, network with them, and over time they might uh, follow you. But if you aren't participating, you can't expect people to follow you just like that. Michael, I hope you and I are on that list. I mean, just, just if it's no, no. You'll be on the list, but not, not likely me. But, uh, but, but followers, how important is, uh, are, are followers as a metric? Well, followers are, are an important metric, but you know the problem is that if your boss comes to you and says, we need 100,000 followers, we need a million followers, you can buy a couple hundred thousand followers for a couple hundred bucks. Please never do that because you will get caught out. There are tools like statuspeople.com that will out you. Anyone can go in there and see how many fake followers you have. This happened the other day. Somebody emailed me and said, wow, how does this person have so many followers? I said, well, let's take a look. And so we went in there and instantly we saw 84% of this person's followers were fake. And instantly, the credibility is lost. And we didn't out this person, but we could have easily just tweeted that screenshot. right? So followers are important, but don't get so obsessed with the number of followers. I can tell you at the Met, we recently crossed a million followers. We are the seventh most followed art museum in the world. But we were named the most influential art museum in the world. And I would gladly give up hundreds of thousands of followers uh, for influence, and that's what you want. 
Are you a person that people listen to, that people care about, that people connect with, people uh, take seriously? Then you'll do fine on Twitter. And you'll build out your base organically, slowly. Don't worry about the numbers, and you'll be OK. So Sri, if the number of followers is not a measure of influence, how, what can we use to, to measure influence? And are there tools that you can recommend that allow us to check the influence of uh, an organization or an individual on social media? Yeah, I, I think that I'm, I'm not saying that followers are not important. You want to grow your followers on a regular basis. You know, every day you have a lot of unfollowers. Uh, I have a friend who has a million plus followers. Every time he tweets, he loses 250 followers. The reason <laughs> is that all these people are like, who is this person? I don't know, and then just delete him. Every time you tweet is a chance for someone, to f new people to follow you, but also current people to unfollow you. So that's why you want to be strategic about your tweets. What am I tweeting? Does it make sense? I spend three to six minutes on every tweet I write because it's that important to me that I want this to be something that, that matters and that people can, can look at. So there are tools that you can find like Crowd Booster um, and others that will show you who your, like Twiangulate helps you find your most influential followers. Twiangulate uh, and Crowd Booster helps you find your followers who are your most loyal followers. There may be somebody only, only, you know, only is a, uh, is, is a, um, a relative term who only has, say, uh, a thousand followers. But if he retweets you 10 times, then, you know, that's 10,000 people potentially that could have seen your, your content. So I would rather be connecting and uh, in, interacting with him and making sure he's taken care of and not and just ignore him completely. So while you need the superstar followers, those folks are rarely going to follow you, are rarely going to retweet you, rarely participate. You need that combination of, of very influential people and then the folks who are loyal. And that balance you have to strike on a regular basis. I think many airlines are so focused on their first class cabins that they're really doing great damage to the people in the back uh, in terms of their interest in flying with them. And that's that balance that I think we could think of for ourselves, that we want to do really nice things for our folks in first class, but we also want to make sure we're giving at least peanuts and more to the people in the back, because you never know who's going to go in which direction. I think i got to stop these analogies. Okay, but it's, of course it's true what you say, but everybody still wants lots of followers. So how do we get more followers? Right, so uh, the, the way you um, think about followers is uh, what can you say that will get you, can, can help you find more followers? What, what are the things you can do? So one of the things I've learned is from, uh, uh, is from watching people who are really successful. And one of the things is great content gets you great followers. Great content gets you great followers, meaning are you posting things that people care about? Is it interesting? Is it things that will, will drive the conversation? Are you contributing in some way? Or do people read your stuff and go, oh, God, what a boring guy? So that's the first step in, in, in making sure that people will want to see. Identify, by the way, those two or three influential people who follow you. Every time you tweet, think about them before you tweet. Because if it's boring, they're going to unfollow you. And that gives you something to latch on to. Is this person following me? Are they going to get bored? The next thing you do is tell people you're on Twitter. Tell people you're on Instagram. Is it on your business card? Is it in your email signature file? Are, are you once a, uh, once, in, once a week on Twitter telling people your new Instagram handle? Uh, on Instagram, do you have a link to your Twitter account? That kind of um, holistic approach where you've got to tell people this. A lot of people think, well, I'm just going to tweet. Everybody's going to see it. It is just not true. Another way to build an audience and uh, build followers is by networking. Just the way you build your physical network, you want to build your digital network. Go to events, and there, make sure you tell people you're on Twitter. Participate in, uh, in as many uh, Twitter chats as possible. But remember, people will see your work but is that tweet interesting? Because if the tweet is boring, it's just a waste of, waste of time. Uh, 
whenever you participate, you've got you've got like ten seconds to make an impression. Also, please put a clear, recognizable, recent photograph of you in your Twitter bio so people know who this is. And spell out your bio really clear about who you are, your background, and what you're going to be posting about. And then people will follow you. You've got a couple of seconds when people say, I wonder who this person is. Click, they see who you are, and they click out. But they might follow you if you're if you're interesting, if your content is interesting. And now on Twitter, they have that extra, like that Twitter profile section above, that kind of that header background. You could put things in there that makes it clear you're an interesting, savvy person that people will, you will add to my content and my info stream and not dilute it and not pollute it. That's what you need to be clear to everyone about. I totally, totally agree with you. I, I, I think it, for me, it takes less than 10 seconds uh, to determine, probably less than five seconds to determine whether I'm going to follow someone on Twitter. Uh, you know, the, 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 the avatar, the bio, you know, if you have a locked account, forget about it. Uh, <laughs> I have no interest in joining accounts that are locked. So you, you're spot on. It, it, that, that, that first impression, you really have only a few seconds. So we talked about avatar bio. And obviously, I look at the four or five tweets uh, in the stream to make sure that uh, you know that, that, that it's pers hopefully a like-minded person. Let's talk about the type of content. What are, what's the, what are some of the types of content that you would share to grow your network and really build uh, good, solid connections? People love content that is itself shareable with other people. So making sure you're posting things that are relevant that are uh, newish to the stream doesn't have to be brand new, but newish. And um, and what do you do? You have a unique take on something that's going on. That like that would be important. The other thing I I'm urging people to do is every time you post something, think about using a photograph or a video when you can, because what people do is uh, they're just constantly you know scrolling with their thumbs on Twitter. So. Like this, when I'm looking at uh, when I'm looking at the feed, I'm constantly going like this. I'm sorry, I know it's hard to see, but I'm just going like this with my thumb. So I said, tell people create thumb stoppers, a, a, a piece of uh, an image or a um, or a, a video is a thumb stopper, and your thumb will stop on it. You'll take a look, and then you'll keep going, and you'll see, you'll notice that you're stopping more on something with an image than without an image. So put in images when it makes sense, and there's so many good tools that allow you to do this, including uh, places like canva.com and uh, other tools that help you design social images and social graphics. So I would, I would think about that. Um, I would also uh, show people the kind of access you have to unusual things. People love uh, unusual things, things uh, access to things they can't see, and uh, tools like Periscope and others uh, show people that access that you have. But nothing really substitutes for smart, intelligent, uh, and interesting, and occasionally fun, and occasionally funny content. It doesn't mean you have to be boring on social media. What it means is be strategic and think about uh, what you're posting. And if you do that, you will have great success. How should we use hashtags? So you know how on TEDx talks people talk about saving the earth and saving the planet and feeding the poor? Uh, I did a TEDx talk about hashtags and why we should use them better. So now I'm getting the lightning part of this for Mike. You can use hashtags in order to build a digital fence around the content and the conversation that you want to have. If you're organizing an event, you want to have a clear, recognizable, unique hashtag that then you can use to build that fence and get people inside the conversation and then track that conversation. If you're on the outside and you are interested in participating, find the hashtags and participate using the hashtag. And by the way, if you run a conference or anything like that, please print the hashtags early. I mean, decide them early, put them on the invitations, put them on name tags, put them everywhere so that people know what they are. You've got to be semi-obnoxious with your own hashtag. You have to tell people what it is and then kind of hit them again and again with it so that they will use it. There's no point 
Um, I did a piece once that you can find. I compared how the Grammys use the hashtags with where the where uh, the Oscars use the hashtags in the same year, and Grammys trended because they were using one hashtag and they told everybody. Oscars were using multiple hashtags and it got diluted. Pick one hashtag and be on it, and you'll do great. Shri, we have a question from Frank Scavo on Twitter. Frank is a prominent industry analyst, and he states that following everyone back uh, seems to be one way to build more followers, but it doesn't seem that you practice that. Can you talk a little bit about your methodology in terms of you know how, following people back in terms of a, a strategy to grow your, your the size of your network? Frank, thank you. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who play these follow back games where I'll follow a hundred people hoping eighty people follow me back and then and then I'll unfollow people. And that's a lot of work that I don't want to I don't think it's an authentic way to follow people. I think if someone's interesting, you should follow them. And if they're if they're not interesting, it's okay uh, to not follow them. Your your followee list, the people you're following should be in constant flux. You should be unfollowing people, adding more people, etc. But also, there's a point beyond which Twitter becomes useless because there's so much, so many people you're following. D decide what that comfort level is for you. For some people, it's 200 folks. For some folks, it's 200,000 folks. And you see that 20,000 follower, followees, etc. But let's find the thing that makes sense for you and then you can participate. And that's why Twitter lists are also really important. But uh, at, at, at the base level, I don't have time to follow back everybody, but I'm using tools that tell me who am I following, who am I not following. I love a tool called CrowdRise, which tracks on your phone, can tell you who your recent followers are, and then I'll read through them. I see that they're, it's better laid out than on Twitter. And then I keep following people. I unfollow people when they're boring. And so that's what I do. Others will follow a lot of folks. I just looked the other day, and uh, there are about 500 people I follow that don't follow me back. I don't take it personally. The people who unfollow me, and I don't get upset about it, maybe a little upset, but not too much. <laughs> Shri, let's compare. When I say let's, that's like sort of the royal we, meaning you. <laughs> let's compare uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and Instagram. Boy, LinkedIn is the most underappreciated social network in history. It is more important than it's ever been, and people still don't get it. Uh, everybody I know is on LinkedIn, but they barely use it as well as they could. They think about LinkedIn as a job hunting site, which it is, but it's really a career management a life website that you can use that can have a direct impact on your future and the futures of the people in your network. But people just don't understand that. A lot of business people do understand that, but even they are not using it properly. So LinkedIn, that's if, if that's the kind of comparison you want to you want to make, I would say LinkedIn is something we could all work on. LinkedIn has recently opened up publishing so that everyone can publish content on there. If I were starting a blog today, I would make sure I was posting on LinkedIn rather than just posting on another platform. Why not be on the network where your uh, your colleagues, your competitors, and your future colleagues are all working already, are using it every day, and they're looking for good content. So that's why I encourage you to use LinkedIn uh, I've recently started posting on a more regular basis. I need to do better myself on LinkedIn, and I urge you to do that. My wife, who posts on LinkedIn, she finds a lot of traction, and uh, it's a good place for her for business leads and other things. So I encourage you to, uh, to do more on LinkedIn. Instagram, a place where uh, it's, it's surprising that it's so successful considering it has zero traffic. Right? We always think everything's about traffic and there's zero traffic, but meaning you get zero traffic to your content. It's all about being great on the platform itself. Uh, Twitter we've talked a lot about, and Twitter is for quick, short content and, uh, and short bursts of information back and forth. You have to have a lot of patience to use, LinkedIn, uh, use Twitter and be smart on it and to have success on it. Um, some of the people on, uh, you know, one of the uh, co-founders of 
Twitter, uh, Biz Stone used to say that he's surprised how successful Twitter has been considering how complicated it is to use. And uh, so that's one of the problems on Twitter. And then finally, Facebook uh, is bigger and more important than it's been. And there's a lot of talk of Facebook fatigue. People aren't as interested. It's all about Snapchat and all these other tools. The things that Facebook has done in the last couple of years, I call it the empire strikes back. And you are seeing the role that Facebook plays in the world. And between Facebook, which also owns Messenger, which also owns WhatsApp, which also owns Instagram, you've seen the total domination of, of, uh, uh, of Mark Zuckerberg and company. So much so that, that when Twitter grew by 2 million people, it was considered to be in deep trouble. And that's where I think Wall Street and others need to give Twitter a break and say, this is not going to be Facebook. It has its own place and its own success metrics. How can we avoid being obnoxious in social media? <laughs> uh, one of my favorite sayings, what's common sense in real life is common sense in social media. Uh, don't be obnoxious in real life and you won't be obnoxious on social. Uh, be yourself. Think about everything you post. Everything every, I, I said I spend three to six minutes on every tweet I write. I write every tweet as if it's my final tweet, as if I'm about to get hit by a bus. And if I get, not, if I get hit by a bus, I know that the last tweet is what they're going to use in, uh, you know, my friends are going to pull that out. What was the last thing he said? So I think about that. If, if your last tweet, if you pay attention to your tweets and say, I'm not going to pick fights with people, at least publicly, then you will be much more careful and less likely to get in trouble and less likely to get in trouble and therefore less likely to be obnoxious, I hope. You know, it looks like we lost Vala. Vala My goodness. <laughs> Vala, where are you? Out there in the ether somewhere. Uh, and we're, we're just about done with, with this lightning round. Oh, there's Vala back. Uh, <laughs> so let's just say our last question in the lightning round is, if you're tweeting at an event, how do you balance live tweeting an event without annoying all of your followers and dumping all of this stuff on your followers who are not present? Uh, I, I had that exact situation. I was at the Code Conference, uh, which is run by Walt Mossberg and Kara Swisher, uh, and the hashtag is CodeCon. And, uh, you know, Mary Meeker, every year she unleashes her internet, mm -hmm. state of the internet slides there. And uh, this year she had 197 slides in 30 minutes. So, you know, you, you got to imagine everybody in the world is kind of tweeting that, or everybody there is tweeting that and then it's being amplified, it's on CNBC, et cetera. What can you do? What can you bring to it? So what I decided is I'm going to take pictures of just a few of the slides and focus on the topics that I know my audience may be interested in. So I picked out the China slides. I picked out the India slides and only tweeted like three things there. I wanted to say not that what I'm doing is unique or special, but is it less likely to be the 5,000th tweet about the same thing and rather maybe the fourth tweet about the same thing. That's how, how you do it. You also want to be very clear. You can even apologize in advance, as some people do when they're live tweeting, to say, hey, folks, I'm sorry for the next hour. I'm going to be tweeting from this. No one I've ever seen has gotten upset if your content's going to continue to be true to you, meaning it's useful, helpful, uh, and, uh, and adds value to the conversation. If that's the case, it's going to be fine. If it's boring or it's just the same old, same old, then people are not going to pay attention. Shri, I think, did you have any advice? Uh, go ahead. I was going to say, I think oh, uh, I hammered a little bit. I'm sorry, I missed that. What was that, more? For Twitter, I mean, there's rumors about companies like Google, Apple, Microsoft should buy Twitter to boost their social presence. And, uh, you know, they seems like at even 315 million followers, there's a bit of a slowdown in the U.S. in terms of folks getting on Twitter. Any advice as a super user for, for Twitter uh, in terms of how they can uh, grow? I, I, yeah, I'll say that I am very bullish about Twitter and its potential, but I'm only worried that 
that Twitter will overreact to these ridiculous uh, valuations that people want it to have. Uh, I said that uh, only in today's world where you get two million new customers in a, uh, in a particular <laughs> period and you're told you're failing and you're in trouble, that's the problem. It's Wall Street. It's the venture capitalists. It's their fault that they have taught us that it has to be unlimited growth forever, otherwise you're in trouble. It has never happened in history that you need this much uh, constant, uh, like th these, this kind of scale. I mean, they all, Wall Street always wants growth, but not the, the scale. So I think if Twitter says, we're not Facebook, but we're so integrated into the lives of the people who do use us, and we're going to continue to be useful, we have to take care of the spam problem, the bot problem, they are trying new things in user experience, in design, to make it more relevant, more useful. I think they're taking it to four photographs and allowing you to tag up to ten people in a, in a single tweet. I think that's a great step that they've taken. I love the feature where you can shoot and edit a, a, inside a tweet. Up to 30 seconds, you can shoot and edit inside a tweet. I think it's a game changer. Uh, those are the kinds of things that they can continue to build on instead of overreacting and being forced by Wall Street and their funders and, uh, and others to do things that they don't want to do. I think they should be confident about who they are. They'll do great. I agree with you 100%. 100%. And, you know, uh, Frank Scavo, who's a great industry analyst, he comments regarding your what you were saying earlier about tweeting at events, uh, not to use Twitter as your notepad, but rather offer some interpretation and insight. I think that's brilliant. I, I, if it's okay, I'm going to use your, I'm going to use that, Frank, as the as as a, a as a great way of thinking about it. So not just regurgitating whatever has just been said, but giving an angle, giving explanation, context, I think that's a great idea and something that people will value. I agree. You know, we're just about out of time. This went by that pretty, a, pretty fast. That, that was a lightning round, Michael. And again, as usual, Sri dropped a ton of science on us and beautiful content for us to share with our audience. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be of help. I use a hashtag, hash learn social media, and I've been tweeting up, uh, now to 85 different things I've posted. So if you go online and you search my name and learn social media, you'll see uh, that I'm trying to build um, a kind of useful content around there. I also want to tell your folks that uh, I, uh, I'm always happy to answer questions, and my Twitter handle is at Sri, but my email is Sri at Sri.net. S-R-E-E -E at S-R-E-E dot net. Three dot com is a chain of motels in Florida. And so you may <laughs> want to stay off there, or maybe not, maybe get a place in Florida. But uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and I encourage all of you to check out what we're doing on at Met Museum and see how we as a business, a small but important business, are trying to keep up with all of you who are doing all this great stuff in the digital world. So you're the chief digital officer of one of the... Uh, most venerable museums in the world, and you don't mind giving out your personal email in public. Why is that? Well, well uh, now you make me feel bad. No, uh, now I'm working. <laughs> you know, I, used to, I used to do a lot of TV, and I used to give out my email address. On and, TV? On, on TV. And one thing you learn is not a lot of people are watching TV with a pen in their hand, so that was one thing. But um, also, I have in my email inbox... Uh, a million plus unread email messages uh, in Gmail. I I have um, wa I've been uh, I've always wanted to be a million. I tweeted this the other day. I always wanted to be a millionaire. I didn't know it would be in an un on a million unread Gmail messages that I would be a millionaire. In. But uh, seriously, it's about the content you 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 write to somebody. If it's interesting, people will open it. You have to be good at being really clear in your subject line. Same thing like a tweet. If it's clear in the subject line. I'll open it. Like, I'm here because of Gmail, uh, because I responded to you guys on email, right? That's how this kind of stuff works. Email still counts. Everybody is like, oh, Slack is the only thing that matters, Snapchat, whatever. Those are all important and useful, but email still makes the world go round, still makes, still makes business happen. At the Met, we, we send out 55 million emails a year, so we understand the value of email. Wow. 
You know, and I, actually, I'll say also that I get a lot of emails. My inbox is not quite a million unread, but I get a lot of emails as well. And every now and then, an email comes through from somebody you don't know that is so insightful and short and to the point and useful that you respond and genuinely you can build a relationship off of that just by sending a short email. Yeah, I, 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 I totally understand that. I just want to mention one thing if you haven't seen it. This website called Crystal, crystalnose.com, K-N-O-W-S. What it does is it takes your, as you're writing to somebody, it will study their email personality and give you feedback on what kind of email to write to them. It is either the greatest thing I've ever seen or the scariest thing I've ever seen. So check it out, Crystal knows knows.com. Have you guys seen that yet? Not, not yet, but we'll, we will look. Yeah, you will look. <laughs> and so episode number 126 draws to a close. Shri, thank you so much for your uh, thought leadership, and thank you for being not only interesting, but also interested. Thank you. We have been talking with Sri. Srinivasan, who is the Chief Digital Officer at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And we're going to be doing uh, two CXO talk shows next week. So check the website, join us, and sign up for the mailing list. Thanks so much, everybody. And Vala, we'll see you out there in the ether soon. You got it. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>